Welcome back, baseball fans. 1979-82 Fall League uh, draft. We are looking at the token round of the draft, the last part of the drafting process to get rosters ready to start a season. Um, just a, another review. Um, kind of show you where we started, where we had um, over 2,500 players. Um, that's 640 for the four years. Now, of course, all are available because they have multiple cards in the years. And then you have 384 guys that each team uh, uh, starts with. That's 12 players for the 12 teams. Um, with six in the year 80, four in 81, and two in 82. And so the draft is you get two from the four years so that you have eight, six, four, and two. That's the the, the math we use to, to keep the league constant and, and to keep the rules on uh, continuous and, can, and the makes it very competitive to get all the teams sorted properly and comporting to the proper math and the proper positions and so forth. And then we've gone through the process of identifying guys they, that wanted to be kept and then guys, uh, four players per team uh, were on the team last year and they want to come back, meaning that these are all players who whose card was in 1979 and, and it's up to a team to give them a new card for 80, 81, or 82, or 83. And, and the original team, or the team they were on a year ago, four of the eight that disappeared uh, are protected as keepers. Two of those per team have to put on waivers, but they're still looking for work, probably like a one-year contract uh, at the end of the career, kind of moving on. And then uh, retiring players, even if you see that occasionally a player sprinkled out through here, doesn't really retire, he just misses some baseball, comes back in a following season. Um, which takes us to the draft of 384 plus 8 rounds, 32 uh, picks per team is 256. So you think we have our 640, but we don't. We don't have exactly 640 because teams during the draft could decide to improve players instead of adding new ones by simply swapping out a card into a different year. Um, when we look at these codings for all the teams, Seattle was drafting first, so we cluster their eight picks in one area. The Twins pick second, their picks are all clustered. All the teams' picks are clustered eight per team, 32 teams is 256. You basically have your first pick from one of those four years, and then your second pick from one of those four years. Um, if it is indeed one of those keepers, uh, indicated by this color blue and the letter K in, in the C column, which is uh, status. If a guy was signed off of waivers, uh, he's yellow here. Uh, here's an example. Bill Fahey, I believe, was put on waivers by um, the Padres, and Seattle picked him up. And uh, the White Sox put Gary Renneke on waivers via the Orioles, and Colorado picked him up. And you see that's what the yellow means. The blank color, the white ones, are the ones that have not been in the league yet, or rookies. The red guys were called out of retirement and said, hey, we need help. <laughs> we couldn't find a guy on the street. I know you're on the easy chair, but would you like to come back for another season? And then, of course, these improving players are in this light green mint shade. For instance, Pat Zachary was improved to get him into his 83 season where he lowered his ERA by half a run. And that meant that this, they were short a player. And in summation of the, of the player shortages, I did a, a sort, I copied and pasted and did a sort. And there were all, these were the players who got better. Um, Lou Whitaker got into his 83 card, as did Lloyd Mosby. Cal Ripken got into his 83 MVP card. See some great players here, Wade Boggs. Most of the players you see here are, are going to be good, or obviously are getting better if that was the decision to improve them into a new year. But it meant that they uh, had a vac vacancy on the roster. Fortunately, 
um, when during the draft process, when we improve a player, one thing we do here in this uh, right here, where it says C83, uh, meant that 83 was the year we took that player, but it meant that we abandoned his 82 card, and he was the fourth player in the year of 82 for the Tigers, for Lou Whitaker. This is what, what this says is, is that we had Lou Whitaker's 1982 card, but we thought the 83 card was worth improving. Uh, same, you know, with Cal Ripken, 82 rookie year, played at third and short, hit 264. In 1983, he wins a World Series, I think he's the MVP, it's 318. So this will always give a trail of the record that needs a new player. Which brings us to the token round of the draft. This is where teams can do any of three things. The first thing they should probably do is fill the hole in the roster vacated by these 37 players. They can also decide simply to look at the roster and they, maybe they just don't like a guy on the roster. They, he's, been, he's been in this um, carry-on list you know, all off season, but maybe looking closely, it's like maybe we should have just cut this guy. I, I know his card is tan is tangible and in the stack. We could still cut him in this per part of the draft and find somebody else. And so there, the third option would then be simply to pass to say, nope, we're locked in. We like our twenty man roster. So those are the three options in the token round in the draft, and we only at this point need. The order. How do you figure out how who goes first and who gets who? Well, we have a draft order beginning with Seattle, and you saw that at the, at the at other sheet. They pick first. We know the Expos won the World Series. They pick 32nd. Phillies pick 31st. So there is a token system. Everybody gets five tokens, units, dollars, whatever you want to call it. And then if you make a trade or if you uh, uh, assign a player to another team, or if you need to balance out a trade that seems one-sided, you would add a token. And so every transaction, most transactions are balanced, but if there's an imbalance transaction, then a token is, is added or subtracted. So we start with five. 32 teams start with five for 160. 32 teams end with 160. It's just that teams, will add and subtract tokens based on how active they are and balancing out their roster. So you're gonna see minus ones and plus ones in each column. And then once the column overflows, move to another column, move to another column. The point being is, every time you do a plus one on a trade, you put a minus one someplace else accordingly. And so now we have the total tokens are here in this column. It's still 160, but teams have more than others. In the particular draft, the Cubs acquired eight draft tokens. And one of the ways they acquired eight draft tokens was they uh, traded Dave Kingman. They traded Bill. Um, they traded Dave Kingman. They traded Bruce Suter. They traded uh, Rick Russell. So they basically didn't even want any of those three guys. And they, the trade, the what was returned to them in compensation wasn't overwhelming, so they had, uh, acquired a token in each of those moves. To get to eight tokens, the highest token amount, followed by teams who have seven, and then six, five, and of course you're going to have teams with three or perhaps even two. Maybe one. We've had a year where the Yankees had zero because they used all their money up. So then your draft list is sorted by tokens, priority one, and draft order, priority two. And that takes us to uh, the analysis. And I won't go deep into this analysis. I'll find some stuff. But I'm just kind of kind of showing you the process of how we competitively give every, every team an opportunity um, to compete. Um, we have some more information here. Um, for players, for the 37 players who were improved and they have a vacancy on the roster, 
Uh, this is some shorthand for uh, potential needs. Uh, RR means ready reliever. Uh, 3VL, first baseman versus lefties. 9VL, right fielder versus lefties. LRP, left-handed relief pitcher. Um, yeah. CFVL, center fielder versus lefties. You get the idea. It's just shorthand. It doesn't... It helps me... I, I see this and it speeds this drafting process up and helps helps me out. So it lets me know the, the needs. Also, I have... Uh, I needed a placeholder if a if a player was going to move off of the carry on. Let me give you an example. Aurelio Rodriguez. So he was a look at this a tiger, and this is where we started. He was a tiger uh, at the beginning of the draft process at the end of last season. He was considered player seven of eight in that 80 list. The Tigers decided they wanted to move off of him into a different player. So we, we simply moved that record away from the Tigers, but also made it uh, visible so that the rest of Major League Baseball knew that, hey, Aurelio Rodriguez is available if you, if you want him. The Tigers just are making a move. So players like him, Ted Cox, Tim Corcoran, Craig Stymack, uh, actually did not find homes. They were swapped out for the attempt of improvement, of improvement, along with some more guys here, Dave Roberts, Duffy Dyer, and then Glenn Abbott at the very end was probably the last player to be removed from the league with a replacement. So with that, let's show you how the, how the token round of the draft started. And the Cubs, this is the team name here. Um, in this column, the, the first column here, I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Um, we had 128 uh, picks available. Uh, we have, so 128 would have been the last one. Team 32, which was the Expos, which, which passed at the very end of the draft. Um, and then, of course, a lot of teams were passing by the end of the draft. So once you scroll back up, you, uh, we'll get to all this activity. So the first thing the Cubs did, they had eight tokens, so they get to do the first move. And this was a clever series of moves they did. First thing that they did was they identified that um, they did not have a... 1980 availability so they had a 1981 availability so they took Dan Graham he's a catcher for Baltimore and they knew he was good in 1980 but not 1981 didn't matter they took him here and by taking this inferior player it meant that nobody else could take the 1980 Dan Graham card which a lot of teams wanted as a matter of fact the very next team the San Diego Padres needed a 1980 catcher and the first top pick was just taken off the board dan graham in this case and it was they they took john tamargo a switch hitting a catcher who uh played for the expos in 1980 and then um let me just figure complete the the cubs scenario then the cubs and uh decided to swap out 1980 Pete McCann and basically cut him who was on their team so they had a spot 1980 and then just flipped the Dan Graham card in its spot and so here you can see Dan Graham's stats so he had 278 with a 481 slugging 791 OPS has homers on 17 and an 18 chance on 8 so he's a one way platoon pet, uh, catcher with plenty of power so he gives the Cubs power in that uh, lineup there. And so that's how they were able to do it because they had to pick a player in 81 with their uh, vacancy. And, they, and the player that vacated and, and say, how, who did the Cubs improve so that they um, got this opportunity, you could say, is Jerry Morales. So Jerry Morales 81 card 
was improved to his 82 card in the draft, which he hit very well, had, had a lot of power. That was one of his best years, 1982. So because of that vacancy, uh, the Cubs ha had to go into 81, and that's what they did. They did Graham. That uses up one token. So now we're down to the teams with seven tokens, of which there were simply just um, these three, San Diego, Florida, or and the Cubs, of course. Eight minus one is now seven, so they fall into the sevens. And then after that, in this column here, you have the, um, the token number. So we're down to the sixes. And the Padres, believe it or not, passed. They were happy with how they drafted and said, we got an extra dollar that we not, would not normally have had, or an extra token, an extra move, don't need it. We're happy with how, how the draft went. So as did Florida. So that means that if we scroll down on this list, anytime you see SDP for San Diego, it's always going to be a pass. And then Florida passes. The Cubs, again, they can you can keep picking. And the next thing they did was that 81 spot that they had Graham in, that they flipped out of, they got 81 Burt Campanaris in that spot. So it was Dan Graham in that year. Um, then it turned into Dan Graham into a different year. And Campanaris is a middle infielder replacing Pete McCannon. So what they looked at was uh, we wanted Dan Graham and we wanted Burt Campanaris over Pete McCannon. The Yankees got Bob Watson 1980. That's a great pick just sitting there for them. Normally they run out of money, not in this draft. They, they actually had some. Seattle uh, took a keeper, Enrique Romo, from the Expos, who net didn't make a move for him in the draft. Um, it came down to one player of the year, 1980, for the Expos, and they picked Larry Parrish over Enrique Romo and Elia Sosa. So the Mariners got Romo. I'm not going to do go through the whole list. I'll just give you some highlights. Uh, the Red Sox got the 82 Brian Harper card, which crushes left-handed pitching. Um, the Pirates made a nice little move here, getting the 82 Howard Johnson card when he was actually a 21-year-old member of the Tigers at 316. Um, the Mets, uh, in their roster, they had Jose Morales, a 40-25 first baseman plus John Stearns. They needed an everyday first baseman, and Willie Montanez's final decent year, 1980, was there. I think Montanez played for the Mets in 79. So to find a starting first baseman in the token round of the draft is kind of stunning. And Montanez isn't glamorous at his age here. Where does he say? He's only 32, but it, it's 274, 353, 679. But again, he's is a two, and um, he's better than most else that was on the board um, looking for once you get you know deeper into this more teams are passing and then also you're gonna see guys who aren't really sexy picks here matter of fact Sparky Lyle won the World Series for the Expos a year ago and was happy in retirement he was going fishing and the Tigers called him and said we really need you. Well, there's no left-handed relievers left on the board. Can you can you come back? Can you put the fishing tackle down and come out and play for us? And 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 they're looking at these numbers. Sparky's 80. He's got a 4.69 ERA, a 155 WHIP, in 80 innings gives up 97 hits, 28 walks, 43 strikeouts. Just pretty below average, mediocre year. But because he throws left-handed, the Tigers. Got him. We had Gary Christensen, 517 ERA for Kansas City, taken because he throws left handed. And then, real late in the process here, the Mets had second thoughts on Glenn Abbott and they switched over to Rick Russell as the ace of their staff. The Mets have everything except starting pitching, and that comes next year in 84 when Dwight Good and Ron Darling show up. Um, but for right now, they have Rick Russell and Frank Tanana in the 1-2 spots. Um, 
as we get to the end here, um, we find that uh, teams, some teams who don't, didn't have money, you see the number of tokens three. Um, in this case, it, it really was Baltimore, Cleveland, and Houston are teams that needed players who didn't have any money. So they had to wait. Uh, if you look at these, uh, the, the, the player selection number, you know, 86 players in, including teams that pass, go by before Baltimore and Cleveland, and I believe Houston as well, get to take a player. So um, that's, that's what happens if you go through this improvement process and you don't have any money left. you got to sit and wait and wait and wait and wait. And that's, that's the, uh, the pros and cons of improving players. It's really fascinating to, uh, to look at these options, but it's all done in the, in the nature of ultimate competitiveness of the league. Uh, the greatest baseball teams in this era are, are pretty much knocked down a, a little bit. I mean, Baltimore lost, they lost Ken Singleton, they let Mark Belanger go. Um, and I think the Cubs, it's funny, the Cubs ended up with a lot of these guys from Baltimore. It's funny how, so, the Cubs added Ken Singleton and Mark Belanger. Dan Graham was Baltimore's catcher in 1980. They also added Burt Campanaris, former Oakland A. You get the idea that the Cubs were simply going for guys from from a, uh, a winning franchise to help them out. We saw this in the fall, uh, summer league in the early late 60s, early 70s, when the Toronto Blue Jays were taking all the discarded New York Met players like Tommy Ag and Don Clendenon, and currently Ed Cranepool, all, all ending up on the Toronto team. This was one of the later picks. The Cincinnati Reds needed a backup catcher, and Mike O'Berry actually was Cincinnati's backup catcher with a minus two arm. Sometimes the fit is perfect, meaning that pretty much every team didn't want this guy, except for Johnny Bench's team, because Bench has got a plus two arm because he's very old in 1981. So Mike O'Berry will be the defensive fill-in for Johnny. And so at the very end of the token draft, Houston is has the biggest eye roll here because they needed to get a left-handed starting pitcher. And this is what they found. They roll the dice with Rick Wortham, member of the 1980 White Sox, Four and seven with a 5.97 ERA, and is this the whip here? What's the? Um, that's got to be uh, format there. Yeah. Oh boy, a 1.73 whip and a 5.97 ERA. Looking at the card, he doesn't give up any home runs. He just gives up a ton of walks. In 92 innings, he gave up 58 of them. He is going to be in a rotation sandwiched between Nolan Ryan, J.R. Richard, and Joe Negro. So talk about that one day <laughs> uh, in your in your season where you're going to go to your bullpen, and that's the, that's the day. I guess the Astros are figuring they're not going to need their bullpen much with Richard, Ryan, and Negro on the mound, but when this guy's out there, by the third, fourth, fifth inning, you know, Cincinnati, the final pick, they decided to, and this is interesting because they um, they were weaker against left-handers instead of right-handers. And I mentioned early up in, in this list, there was a player uh, that the Red, here he is, Tim Corcoran. He's a left-handed hitter and the Reds had him. They had too many left-handed hitters and Corcoran's defense wasn't very good. They wanted a right-hander, somebody could hit lefty, so they swapped him out for Mike Ivey. Because uh, Mike Ivey in 1980 can still feel pretty well. He's a two at first, two at 11, and hits left-handed pitching pretty well. So that's like a very late move after most of the league had passed. And Houston and Cincinnati took a, were the only teams taking this extra round of the draft. So that concludes this. It, the 37 mint green, whatever 
guys, those spots were, were filled. And then you have the dark green here are simple replacements. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, ten guys replaced um, seven of those uh, uh, were here and replen you know are, are still available. The other three guys um, didn't play in the league last year and were on the street and got got into the league that way. So that means we have got it, got the league to the proper um, everyone's comported with beginning with Arizona. Everybody has eight players from 1980, six from 81, four from 82, and two from 83. We actually have the, the year uh, indicated there. We even have a formula to match it and to do a reconciliation to make sure everybody's got the perfect math and there's no mistakes or anything. And it just worked out. It works out perfectly. And that's the, that's the joy of this thing when you know, you, you force a, a specific logic for a year and and use good solid numbers that are easy to uh, uh, arrange. And uh, it, it made it very smooth. Uh, uh, I'll wrap this up with, uh, let's just talk about the Expos team that won the World Series. And the green are players who played in that World Series a year ago. Okay, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, Tim Raines also got improved, so he'd be 11. Steve Rogers got improved, he'd be 12. Added to that, uh, Tim Stoddard becomes the new stopper. Baltimore had to put him on waivers because they had too many guys they wanted to keep. Uh, Larry Parrish is coming back, uh, his contract. Again, he was a keeper, and they said, yes, we want Larry Parrish. Um, Mick Kelleher or what used to be a middle infielder, and now it's Louis Gomez, who's a little bit better defensively. Um, Left-handed, they used to have Dave Hamilton in the bullpen. They now have Brad Havens. Uh, they used to have Dan Norman as a corner outfielder against lefties. They now have Billy Sample, who they faced in the uh, League Championship Series uh, with the Angels. Um, they needed uh, right-handed relief help. Mark Bomback actually was a starter, but he was a starter relief, so he's going to pitch in relief with his 81 card. And lastly, the, one of the be be best additions was Charlie Lee. Not losing Charlie Lee, they got him. There was one casualty. They lost Tim Wallach. Third baseman Tim Wallach was lost in this process, a very promising third baseman. They didn't protect him, or they, they, they didn't bring him up, and the Houston Astros uh, plucked him off the practice squad, you could say, uh, for an analogy there. So they look, because they decided to keep Larry Parrish uh, with his 1980 card, they end up losing a nice player, uh, Tim Wallach, to Houston. These things happen, and it often happens to teams that win the World Series. They, they're going to lose some players here and there. But they also lost Bryn Smith, but they have a ton of right-handed pitchers. So they lost Bryn Smith and Tim Wallach. Uh, shed no tears for a team that wins a World Series and loses a guy like that. So that's it for the token round of the draft. And then uh, when we resume, uh, the league will be in full swing in the fall league. And we'll look forward to those games. Thanks for checking this out.